You are listening to The Evidence Locker. Our cases have been researched using open source and archive materials. It deals with true crimes and real people. Each episode is produced with the utmost respect to the victims, their families, and loved ones. Warning, this episode contains details of the most heinous murder. Listener discretion is advised. On Wednesday night, October 30th, 2002, 15-year-old Andreas von Richthofen was having a great time. His older sister Suzanne and her boyfriend Daniel had snuck him out of the house and had dropped him off at his local internet cafe near their home in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where all of them usually played online games together. This night, however, Suzanne and Daniel did not stay, so Andreas joined some friends and logged in for a session of gaming. After a couple of hours, the young couple picked Andreas up again and they headed home. They arrived home between 3 and 4 in the morning, hoping to quietly sneak back into the house. But when they arrived, the front door was wide open. In a city like Sao Paulo, where crime is rife, nobody leaves their front door open. To their horror, Andreas and Suzanne discovered their parents' bludgeoned bodies in bed. They had been attacked while they were sleeping. Manfred and Marizia von Richtofen both had towels covering their faces, and there was blood all over the bedroom walls. On the floor, just out of reach of Manfred's hand, a revolver laid on the floor. However, no shots had been fired. What happened at this home on Rua Zacharias de Gois? In a single night, Suzanne and Andreas von Richtofen were orphaned. But who would want to hurt this family? The von Richtofen family was a well-to-do family who lived in a comfortable home in the affluent suburb of Campo Belo in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The home was on a 100-square-meter property and was tastefully decorated. In the garden was a pool, and staff tending to the property kept it in good shape. 49-year-old Manfred von Richtofen was a naturalized German-Brazilian who worked as an engineering director at Dursa the state company for highway development. Manfred always claimed that he was a descendant of famous World War I pilot with the same name, Manfred Albrecht Freyr von Richthofen, otherwise known as the Red Baron. According to Manfred, his grandfather was the Red Baron's brother. However, the von Richthofen family in Germany deny that there was any link, as the family keeps an active family tree. Manfred met his wife, Marizia Abdallah, in the early 1970s while the two studied at the University of Sao Paulo. After they were married, they went to further their studies in Germany. On his return to Brazil, Manfred started working for private engineering companies until he started at Dursa in Sao Paulo. In this time, Marizia opened her own psychiatry practice and soon became one of the most respected psychiatrists in town. In 1983, they had their first child, a daughter they named Suzanne. Four years later, their son Andreas was born. From the outside in, the von Richtofens appeared to have a happy family life. They weren't overly sociable and kept to themselves for the most part. Manfred was quite reserved, but Marizia was more outgoing. Both kids went to Colegio Humboldt, the German school in Sao Paulo and were good students. According to the principal, the von Richtofen parents were very involved with the kids' education and were well known by everyone at school. Both Suzanne and Andreas had the best education money could buy. Suzanne was a quiet achiever who didn't stand out as being different to any of her classmates. By 2001, Suzanne was 18 years old and she had a lot going for her. She was beautiful and bright and of course, rich. She was in her first year of university, 
studying law at the Pontifical Catholic University, one of the best colleges in Sao Paulo. Suzanne could speak four languages, Portuguese, German, English, and Spanish. She also had a brown belt in karate. That's the one just before black belt. One might say, Suzanne was the whole package. Her friends were fond of her and were amused by her love for stuffed animals. She would find any excuse to buy soft toys for her friends, shaped like a love heart, a smiley face, or even dice, whatever suited the situation best. She loved hanging out in the local shopping mall, spending her allowance on clothes and accessories. In his teens, Andreas took up the hobby of model airplanes. His instructor, 19-year-old Daniel Cravinos, took him under his wing and would take him bike riding and introduced him to online computer games. When 17-year-old Suzanne von Richtofen met her little brother's model airplane instructor, the two also became friends. Before long, they started a passionate relationship, which was to become the core of the conflict in the von Richtofen home. At first, Manfred and Marizia did not care when Suzanne started dating the family friend. They thought it was a passing fling. But over time, the relationship became serious. Manfred and Marizia were worried. To generate income, Daniel would make one or two model planes a month and sell them for just over $1,000. He also maintained and sold parts for hobbyists. Suzanne sometimes asked her father for money to lend her boyfriend and showered him with clothes and gifts. Once the von Richtofen parents learned that their daughter's boyfriend was a habitual marijuana user and noticed that he was reluctant to work or study, they turned against him. The fact that he was from a lower class background was also a factor and they wanted someone with more ambition for their daughter. By the time Suzanne was 18, she spent most of her time with Daniel. She blew off her high school graduation party to spend the night with her boyfriend. When she attended university, the couple were so close that Daniel accompanied Suzanne's law school class on an excursion to the legislative assembly. In his bedroom at his parents' house, photos of Suzanne covered his walls. On his bed was a pillow and printed with a photo of her and dozens of soft toys, all gifts from Suzanne. At the end of 2001, Suzanne began to spend the nights with Daniel on the sly. She told her parents that she was going over to a friend's place to study. Friends were warned to cover for her in case her parents ever called. One April night, the strategy went awry. Marizia called Suzanne's best friend and discovered that her daughter was not sleeping there. When Suzanne returned home the next morning, her mother demanded an explanation. Suzanne said she spent the night in a motel with Daniel. Marizia and Manfred decided to definitively ban the courtship. This only made Suzanne want Daniel more. He showed her a different side of life, less regimented than the one that she grew up in. Daniel had an attitude of anything goes, and he was fun to be around. When she was with him, Suzanne felt free. A friend close to the von Richtofens remembered that success was very important to Manfred and Marizia. They encouraged their kids to be achievers. But other than that, they were focused on their own work and didn't have much time for Suzanne and Andreas. The friend recalls, Since I was little, I always saw Suzanne taking care of him. Suzanne often took Andreas to the Cravinos home with her. The von Richtofen kids would then hang out with Daniel and his older brother Christian, who was in his mid-twenties at the time. The four of them liked going to a local cyber cafe to play online games. Each one had a gaming nickname. Suzanne usually logged in as Sue or Polar. Andreas was Raptor. Christian, Soldado Cat. And Daniel was Kamikaze. Although the youngsters were just having fun, Manfred and Marizia had good reason to be concerned. Daniel and Christian were known troublemakers in the neighborhood where they grew up. It's a working class neighborhood, much rougher than the neighborhood where Suzanne and Andreas were from. There are 10 houses on a narrow walkway. Everyone knows each other, and kids grow up together, playing in the walkway between the houses. Christian and Daniel were known to smoke weed and cause trouble. Christian had been in rehab for his addiction to cocaine, and it was speculated around the neighborhood that he was a police informer. Elderly neighbors moved away because they couldn't stand the noise of the brothers playing drums and shouting profanities. According to the neighbors, the two brothers were destructive, and their parents didn't do much to rein them in. 
Christian always took his dog to poop in front of another neighbor's door. When the neighbor had had enough, he took a shovel and carried the poop to the door of the Cravino's home. Christian was furious and put an end to the fight by smearing the dog poop all over the neighbor's car. This kind of behavior would have been foreign in the upper class world of Manfred and Marizia von Richthofen. Although they probably didn't know exactly what the Cravino's brothers were up to, they felt Suzanne deserved someone better. By May 2002, the conflict between Suzanne and her parents about her relationship with Daniel was escalating. Manfred and Marizia tried everything. At first they pressured Suzanne to end the relationship, but when she refused, they had to try another approach. Manfred then focused on Daniel and tried to persuade him to go back to school and learn English. If Daniel could step up to Suzanne's level, the Von Richtofens thought, perhaps they could be okay with the relationship. But Daniel wasn't interested. He was young and didn't have many responsibilities and enjoyed his life. In July of the same year, Manfred and Marizia left Sao Paulo to go to Europe for a month. Suzanne stayed home and Daniel practically moved in. Suzanne loved living with Daniel, so when her parents returned from their holiday, she told them that they were moving in together. She suggested Manfred and Marizia buy her a flat where she could live with Daniel. Obviously, Manfred refused. He did say, however, that Suzanne and Daniel could do whatever they wanted as long as they paid for it themselves, once she had completed her education and found a job. The spoiled rich girl and the weed-smoking boyfriend did not take this as an option. It was easier to live off the Von Richtofen's allowance and hang around in the cyber cafe, smoking weed and playing games all day. Manfred was desperate to get his daughter out of this situation and looked into sending Suzanne to Europe to complete her education. When Suzanne heard about this, she told her parents that she had broken it off with Daniel. She wanted to alleviate pressure at home but had no intention of actually ending the relationship. Marizia von Richtofen reportedly told her friends with joy that Suzanne had gotten rid of Daniel. Suzanne started seeing Daniel behind her parents' backs undoubtedly adding to the excitement of her illicit affair was somewhat of a bad boy. But Manfred was no fool, and he had suspected as much. On Saturday the 26th of October 2002, he went to the Cravino's home where Daniel lived with his parents to look for his daughter, but he didn't find her there. He's right about them being together. However, there's no way he could have imagined that his daughter wasn't only lying to him, but that she was planning something far more sinister. If only he knew what was brewing. The two lovers did not like to be told what to do and how to live. Sure, the comforts and cash that came with being a Von Richtofen was nice, but dealing with Manfred and Marizia became a problem. What if they could fix the problem somehow? They would have liked to keep the money, but it was time for Suzanne's parents to go. And that's when a plan was hatched to kill Manfred and Marizia Von Richtofen. On Wednesday morning, October 30th, 2002, Suzanne made a point of going about her normal routine. She attended law school. Like every Wednesday, she attended classes in sociology and foundations of public law. Her behavior was normal. She was calm and quiet, and she didn't draw much attention to herself. Daniel was in charge of providing weapons for this planned attack. He found two hollow iron bars which he modified himself. He filled them with wood, making them heavier. This would be more effective in executing their victims. On the night of October 30th, the murderous plan was set into motion. Around 9.30 p.m., Suzanne left her parents' home in Campo Bello and drove to Daniel's family home. The couple took a cocktail of marijuana, paint thinner, and glue and went over their plan one last time. Then they went to the Von Richtofen home to sneak Suzanne's younger brother, the 15-year-old Andreas, out of the house so as to get him out of the way. Sometime after 11 p.m., Andreas Von Richtofen, who was unaware of the murder plot, snuck out and met his sister and her boyfriend who were waiting outside in Suzanne's Volkswagen Golf. They dropped Andreas at the Red Play Internet Cafe where he met up with some friends for a night of gaming. They arranged to pick up Andreas later. Andreas didn't think that this was strange. In fact, as a 15-year-old kid, 
He thought his sister and her boyfriend were doing him a favor, helping him to sneak out in the middle of the night to go and play games with his friends. Like most days, Christian Corvinos was at the very same Red Play Internet Cafe from around 10 a.m. till around 11 p.m. He left before Andreas arrived to wait for Suzanne and Daniel at a predetermined location. While Andreas assumed the life of his gaming persona, Raptor, Daniel and Suzanne picked up Christian who was ready and waiting. High on obsessive love and drugs, they were on their way to execute the plan that was two months in the making. When the trio arrived at the Von Richtofen home around midnight, Suzanne opened the garage door with her remote control and parked her car in the garage. She gave Daniel and Christian surgical gloves so they wouldn't leave any fingerprints. They wore pantyhose on their heads to prevent head hair from falling out and placing the brothers at what was about to become a crime scene. Daniel and Christian waited outside while Suzanne went inside. As she entered the home, she punched in the code to disarm the house alarm and went upstairs to check if her parents were asleep. What went through her head is she saw the people who gave her life and loved her, breathing their last breaths. Only she would know. She was not about to change her mind, though. She proceeded down the hall and switched on the light to signal the Cravinos brothers that the coast was clear. Then, Daniel and Christian entered the home through a door that Suzanne unlocked, carrying modified iron bars, ever ready to launch their brutal attack. At 12.15 midnight, the Carvinos brothers went upstairs while Suzanne von Richtofen waited downstairs. Christian went into Mauricia's side of the bed, while Daniel towered over a sleeping Manfred. The attack began, the young brothers beating on the von Richtofen couple with the intent to kill. Mauricia had severe defensive wounds, showing she had tried her best to fend off her attacker. After receiving multiple blows to the head, a strange sound was coming from Marizia. If a head-injured victim loses consciousness, they can lose muscle tone in their jaw and the tongue obstructs the airway, causing a loud and disturbing snoring sound. The brothers began panicking. What was happening? Daniel ran to the bathroom and came back with two wet towels. The brothers covered their victim's faces in an attempt to drown out the sounds but it didn't work. Daniel ran downstairs to the kitchen and returned with a pitcher of water and set to drowning them with it. That worked for Manfred, who died first, but not for Marizia. Daniel and Christian tied her head into a plastic bag until she finally expired. When all was quiet and the horrendous task was done, the Cravinos brothers went downstairs to where Suzanne was waiting. When she saw them, Suzanne simply said, Done? Christian was freaking out about what they had just done. But Suzanne consoled him by saying, Calm down, Chris. Stay calm. You did not take anything from me. You gave me a new life. Christian pulled himself together, and the evil trio carried out the next phase of their plan. They ransacked the house, staging a burglary. The brothers knew exactly where all the valuables were, as Suzanne had told them in the days before the murder. They took jewelry and 8,000 cash from Manfred's briefcase. Daniel went upstairs to Manfred and Marizia's room and placed Manfred's 38 caliber revolver that Manfred hid in the false bottom of a bathroom drawer within reach of his hand. Suzanne headed into her father's library and spread papers and documents around. The job was complete, just as they had planned. It was time to leave the Von Richtofen home and secure an alibi. Suzanne and Daniel dropped Christian at a McDonald's near the apartment where he lived with his grandmother. En route, they threw away a garbage bag with the iron bars, surgical gloves, pantyhose, and the clothes Daniel and Christian wore during the attack. Then, Suzanne and Daniel went to Motel Colonial in Sao Paulo's South Zone and booked themselves into a luxurious presidential suite for $380. They had a snack, smoked a joint, and went for a swim. Just before 3 a.m., Suzanne and Daniel left the motel. At Red Play Cafe, online gamer Raptor, or 
Andreas von Richthofen, signed out at 2.55 a.m., just before he was picked up by his sister and her boyfriend. What Andreas didn't know is that he was only another pawn in their plan. Both his parents were dead, and they were about to discover their bodies. As they arrived home, the alarm was disarmed, and the doors were open. It was obvious that there had been a robbery, and now Daniel Cravinos had stepped up to call the police at 4.09 a.m. Police arrived moments later, and they all entered the home together. This is when officers discovered the bodies of Manfred and Marizia von Richthofen. From the get-go, police felt that the incident at the von Richthofen home was an inside job. Something about the burglary didn't seem right. There were no signs of forced entry. And in fact, the house alarm was disarmed. Only select things were taken, but all electronics like computers and cell phones, they were still in the house. All of the four cars were still in the garage. If it were a burglary, police felt, there was no way intruders would have left a prized item like Manfred's revolver behind. Then there was the library. Simply didn't feel authentic. It looked staged with papers being spread around the room rather neatly. The fact that the victims' faces were covered made police believe that the attackers were known to the victims. Police learned about a former family maid who had been fired and had threatened the von Richtofens. But her involvement in the crime was dismissed after extensive police interrogation. Andreas took the news of his parents' murder quite badly. But Suzanne didn't seem too phased about the tragedy she found herself engulfed in. The day after Manfred and Mauricia's murders, Suzanne and Daniel were seen in the swimming pool of the family home. Police decided to keep an eye on the young couple. Within a week of her parents' death, Suzanne inquired if she could sell the house. She seemed to be more concerned about the inheritance than the funeral. In fact, police discovered that Suzanne and Daniel were planning to start a business with the inheritance left by her parents. On the day of Manfred and Marizia's funeral, Suzanne was suitably distressed in front of family and friends. Only hours after the funeral, she happily celebrated her 19th birthday with friends at the home where her parents were murdered. But her behavior wasn't enough to warrant an arrest. Police knew Suzanne and Daniel were involved in the murder, but they had to prove it. With all eyes on the couple and Christian Cravinos, it came to their attention that Christian had bought a motorbike on October 31st, just 10 hours after the crime was committed. He bought a Suzuki 1100 horsepower for $3,600, paying in $100 American bills. He was so sure he would never be caught that he did not bother to hide the bike. Days after the crime, a team of investigators passed Daniel Cravino's house and saw the motorcycle. Suzanne was outraged when she heard about Christian's purchase, realizing that it could draw attention to them. This led to a huge argument between Daniel and Suzanne, who then decided to end their relationship with him. On Thursday, November 7th, police picked Christian up from his home, saying they needed his help in identifying a suspect. He went to the police station and never left. After six hours of interrogation, Christian tripped himself up so many times that he didn't even know what he was saying anymore. He even gave three versions about buying the bike until he admitted that he bought it with his own money. At that moment, his father, Astro Gildo Cravinos de Pala y Silva, left the room, overwhelmed, realizing that his son was indeed guilty. Police went to the von Richtofen house to interview Suzanne. Her brother Andreas was sleeping on a wooden bench downstairs. Suzanne denied any involvement in the crime until a policeman threatened that, if she did not confess, he would also go after Andreas. Suzanne told it all, recalls one of the policemen present at the interrogation. By November 9th, less than two weeks after the double murder, Suzanne von Richtofen, Daniel Cravinos, and Christian Cravinos were all in police custody. Andreas was distraught. He had just lost everybody in his family. Both his parents were dead and his sister was going to jail. 
Daniel and Christian, who were like older brothers to Andreas, were also going away for a long time. He reportedly told his sister, Sue, I lost my father, my mother. I do not want to lose my sister. I forgive you and I will stay with you. But Brazilian law is such that if an individual isn't apprehended in the commission of a crime, red-handed so to speak, it's likely that they will be released from custody while awaiting trial under house arrest. And that's what happened with Suzanne. It would be almost six years before the case would make it to trial. The day before she arrived home, Vandal spray painted the word bitch on the wall of the Von Richtofen's family home. For the moment, Suzanne was free and even launched a lawsuit to take over complete control of her parents' estate. The estate was valued to more than five million US dollars. She might have won it too, if investigators hadn't feared for her brother's safety when they found a revolver hidden inside a teddy bear in Suzanne's room. The murder of Manfred and Marizia was in the media spotlight in Brazil for a significant period of time. People struggled to reconcile the brutality of the crime with the seemingly quiet upper middle class girl. She was always doing well at school and was popular with her classmates. What could have driven her to commit such a heinous crime? It made more sense for the public to blame the drug addicted, underemployed and uneducated Cravinos brothers. The public was divided. Was Suzanne the evil mind behind the killings? Or was she just going along with a plan hatched by her boyfriend and his brother? Suzanne denied being the mastermind, claiming she went along with the plan because she didn't want to lose her boyfriend. She didn't deny involvement, but certainly did not own up to being the driving force. In a televised interview, she said, It was a competition of ideas. I was part of it but the three of us figured it out. I think Christian knew less about the situation, but unfortunately the same cannot be said for Daniel and me. It's part of my life, my story, and I regret it. Many people wanted to believe that Suzanne was under Daniel's spell, that it was nothing but bad judgment on her part that made her go along with the plot. There was an article which tried to explain Suzanne through German-American philosopher Hannah Arendt's theory of the banality of evil. It implies that there wasn't an inherent evil lurking in Suzanne, but rather a sense of thoughtlessness that led to the murder of her parents. A disconnect between plan and the actual brutality of the deed. In Arndt's controversial book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, she concludes that the sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be good or evil. Suzanne's lawyer, self-professed family friend of the Von Richtofen's, Denny Valdo Barney, used this angle to portray Suzanne as an innocent young girl who was led astray. He said that Suzanne had no motive at all. She was forced into an unthinkable situation by Daniel, who she adored like a god. But Barney overplayed his hand. Many people had sympathy for Suzanne and believed that she was as much of a victim of this crime as a perpetrator. In April 2006, Barney arranged a television interview to gain more sympathy for Suzanne. For the interview, she wore a pink Minnie Mouse t-shirt and had colorful hair clips. She looked more like a little girl than the 23-year-old femme fatale she had become. During the interview, Suzanne was crying, clinging to the arm of her lawyer, saying that Daniel had destroyed her family and taken everything from her, her most precious family. She also claimed that Daniel made her take drugs all the time. The next day, the interview resumed, this time with Suzanne wearing a t-shirt with a cute panda bear print. Unaware that the microphone was already on, her lawyer, Denny Valdo Barney, took her aside and instructed her how to behave in front of the camera and what to say about her ex-boyfriend. The news crew recorded Barney saying, start to cry and say you do not want to talk anymore. This interview damaged Suzanne's credibility so badly, her defense team would never recover. As for Barney's argument that Suzanne had no motive to kill her parents, her claims into the Von Richtofen estate opened up a whole other can of worms. Although the declared net worth of the Von Richtofen family was over $5 million, authorities suspected there was more. 
Two Swiss bank accounts were opened by Manfred von Richthofen in November 2001 in his daughter Suzanne's name when she turned 18. They estimated the accounts had a combined balance of at least 10 million euros. The source of this money is believed to be the result of corruption at Dursa, the company where Manfred was director of engineering. The company was responsible for the construction of Mario Kovas Beltway, one of the largest infrastructure projects in Sao Paulo in recent history. This project, originally budgeted to cost around 340 million US dollars, in fact, ran to over $1 billion by the time it was complete. The public prosecutor's office received documents from an anonymous source with evidence of transactions made by an engineering company in Sao Paulo named MAVR Engenaria, registered in the name of Manfred Albert von Richthofen. The official address of the MAVR is next door to the von Richthofen family house in Campobello. The document showed cash deposits into two Swiss bank accounts. However, the investigation was shelved because of a lack of evidence. Suzanne von Richthofen, Daniel Cravinos, and Christian Cravinos were all facing first-degree murder charges. Due to a considerable backlog of cases in the Brazilian justice system, the trial started in July of 2006, almost four years after the double murder of Manfred and Marizia. 200 people filed into the courtroom to witness this high-profile trial. At this point, Suzanne and Daniel had been broken up for about four years. Suzanne blamed Daniel for her parents' murder, and both the Carvinos brothers blamed Suzanne for orchestrating the crime. In court, Suzanne was very cool and calculating and didn't show much emotion. At one occasion, she even started to laugh, while the Carvinos brothers on the other hand, were crying most of the time. It was Christian Cravino's decision to purchase a motorcycle hours after the murder that brought him under suspicion. After his arrest, Christian cooperated with investigators and his account of the murder was what started the investigation into Suzanne and Daniel. However, prosecutors argued that Christian was much older than Suzanne and Daniel. And as the older sibling, he could have, and should have, convinced them not to go ahead with the murder. When Daniel Cravinos took the stand, he said that he had committed the killings alone. His brother did not kill anyone. He claimed that one year into his relationship with Suzanne, she told him she wanted to kill her parents. According to Daniel, Suzanne was physically abused by her father. He said that Andreas von Richthofen knew that his sister was scared of her dad. Andreas would go to a room to prevent Manfred from violating Suzanne. In his testimony, he told the story of a barbecue at the von Richthofen house he attended with Suzanne. He claimed that when Suzanne asked if she could have ice cream, Marizia threw something at her in response. Daniel carried on saying that both Manfred and Marizia had extramarital affairs. He claimed that they were alcoholics and would punish their children whenever they were drunk. This could not be further from the truth. There was nothing other than Daniel's testimony to indicate that the von Richthofen's abused their children, had affairs, or were alcoholics. Andreas von Richthofen publicly denied the abuse allegations. The autopsy reports detected no trace of alcohol on Manfred or Marizia's bodies. Daniel pushed ahead with his testimony, throwing Suzanne under the bus. He said she smoked weed and used heavier drugs too. He only started using drugs while they were dating. Whenever she was high, she would talk about how she wanted to kill her parents. One idea was to burn down the family home while they were sleeping. Another plan was to cut the brakes to her parents' cars. In the end, she persuaded him and Christian to beat her parents to death. He said on the night of the murder, after Suzanne let him and his brother into the house, she told him to be quiet, that they were making a lot of noise. In a chilling account, he recalled when he had entered the room, Suzanne had already run down the stairs. She did not want to hear or even know what happened. After he had rendered Manfred unconscious, he said, Donna Marizia turned. I ran off to the other side and went to Donna Marizia as well. My brother couldn't get it done. He stood still. 
Daniel explained that they left the faces of Manfred and Marizia covered so Andreas von Richtofen did not have to see his disfigured parents. Daniel Cravino stated that days after the murder, Suzanne said that he and his brother were immature and irresponsible and that she should not have trusted them to kill her parents. It was during this argument that Suzanne broke off their relationship. The jury had quite a bit to digest after Daniel's confessions. Although the stories of abuse and alcoholism were untrue, it only put a question mark on the issues of motive. Daniel never denied committing the murders. In fact, he confessed to killing both Manfred and Marizia. The whole nation waited to hear Suzanne von Richtofen's testimony. This was the only time during the trial when she showed any emotion, giving a tearful account of what happened in the early morning hours of October 31st, 2002. She paints a picture of herself as a naive young girl, consumed with love for her boyfriend. Commenting on Daniel's accusations about her father abusing her, she said, My father, in the midst of discussion, slapped me in the face. Something he had never done, never raised his hand to me. According to Suzanne, the idea to kill her parents came from Daniel after this incident. Daniel tried in every way to destroy that beautiful image I had of my father. In fact, I wanted to be close to him and that my parents would accept him, but that was something that could not happen. He was showing me day after day that I did not have that option. Either it was him or my parents. She told the court her version of what happened when they arrived at the Von Richtofen home that fateful night. We got home. I went inside. Went to my parents' bedroom. They were asleep. Then I went down, turned on the light. I told them they can go, and I sat on the couch with my hands covering my ears. I did not want my parents to die. I did not want it. But then I realized that there was nothing I could do, that it was too late. While waiting for the jury of seven members to reach their verdict, Daniel and Christian's mother, Nadia Cavino, spoke to the press. I think this justice is necessary. It hurts, but it is necessary. Prosecution suggested a prison term of 50 years for each of the accused. When the verdict came in, Suzanne von Richtofen and Daniel Cravinos received 40 years in prison, while for his part, Christian was sentenced to 39 years. Prosecutor Roberto Tardelli said, Suzanne wanted to get her hands on the money and assets her parents had worked so hard to obtain. She wanted her freedom and independence without having to work for it. These are two young people who have acted selfishly, ambitiously. They killed without mercy. And that other one who united for stupidity, for money, for gain, is a defect of the human soul. Because of her notoriety, Suzanne von Richtofen was placed in solitary confinement for seven months for her own protection from other inmates. In 2009, Suzanne tried to get her sentence changed to house arrest. Her appeal was denied. She tried again, two years later, with the same result. After Suzanne's arrest, Andreas went to live with his grandmother, Maurizia's mom, Lourdes, and his uncle, Miguel Abdallah. His grandmother tried her best to maintain the same routine Andreas had before his parents were killed. They didn't discuss the murder, as the memory of that night still brought too much pain with it. Andreas was crucified by the media after writing a letter to a local newspaper, which read, Not only did I forgive my sister Sue, but I still love her. Now, especially, it is the moment she most needs love. In spite of the pain, I am sure that our parents have forgiven her. Just yesterday, I heard a phrase that struck me. Humanity must walk together in search of the civilization of love. In the early days of her incarceration, Andreas visited Suzanne by himself. The family did not wish to see her. Daniel and Christian Cravinos were sent to the same prison, but were held in separate units. Daniel still burnt a torch for Suzanne, despite what had played out in court. In his jail cell, he made a mural with photos of his family and Suzanne. At this time, he constantly asked about Suzanne and swore that his love for her would be eternal. Andreas von Richtofen was left alone and recovered from the loss by hitting the books. With the support of his extended family and friends, he managed to complete his doctorate in chemistry from his parents' alma mater, University of Sao Paulo. 
People close to Andreas were concerned about his safety, as he stood to inherit half of the von Richthofen estate. Prosecutor Tardelli warned that this fact would be enough reason for Suzanne to strike again. He suggested that Andreas made a public statement, ensured he had a will excluding Suzanne and leave Brazil for his own safety. After this recommendation, Andreas wrote another letter to a local newspaper. It is clear that his blind loyalty to his sister has waned in the preceding years. I understand that your anger and indignation towards these three murders is immense and much of society shares that feeling. And me too. It's disgusting. Andreas also wanted to address the rumors of Manfred's corruption and the alleged Swiss bank accounts. If there are accounts abroad, present the evidence. Show them what they are and where they are. But if this is nothing more than malicious rumors and there is no evidence, may you retract the allegations and keep quiet about it so as not to let the baseness and cruelty of this crime erroneously stain the reputation of people who are no longer here to defend themselves, my parents Manfred and Marizia von Richthofen. In 2011, Andreas sued his sister for her half of the inheritance, including the money paid out on her parents' life insurance. He won. $300,000 on Manfred's life insurance was paid to Andreas. However, the Swiss bank accounts that Manfred von Richthofen opened are in Suzanne's name. Nothing prevents her from gaining access to the money after serving her sentence. Her lawyer and self-elected family friend, Denny Valdo Barney, maintains by her side, ensuring that she will be eligible to get her money once she is freed. Andreas is skeptical about his sister's lawyer, and at best he can only define Suzanne's relationship with this man as strange. If this Barney was really my father's friend, how had I never heard of him before the crime? That is not the only strange relationship in Suzanne's post-murderous life. Suzanne started dating her cellmate, Sandra Regina Luz, also known as Sandra Bleed. Luz was sentenced to 27 years for the kidnap and murder of a 14-year-old teenager. As a couple, they were given the privilege of sharing a cell. But when Sandra was moved to another prison, their relationship ended. Suzanne refocused her energy and decided to complete her studies. In an interview with Marie Claire, she said she dreamt of starting a family and being a mother. I made a mistake. I'm paying for it, and I want to restart my life. Under Brazilian law, once inmates have served one-sixth of their sentence and have a good behavior record, they are granted temporary release in a program called semi-aberto, Portuguese for half-open, granting inmates more freedom. The inmate has more liberty inside the prison, but it also entitles inmates to six temporary exits from prison for occasions such as Easter, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Christmas, and New Year. Inmates are released to their families to spend time together and be supported by them. When Brazilian press caught wind of Suzanne being granted temporary release from Mother's Day, it sparked an outrage. Nobody knew where she spent Mother's Day, but a television news crew went to Suzanne's mother, Marizia's grave, and found no flowers. The Cavino's brothers were granted the half-open program as well. During one temporary leave, Christian Cravinos hooked up with an old girlfriend and she fell pregnant. Romance was also on the cards for Daniel Cravinos, who met and fell in love with his cellmate's sister, beautiful young scientist Aline da Silva. On his Mother's Day exit, they spent the day together, and by Christmas they were married. Daniel was released in January 2018 after serving 15 years in prison and is rebuilding his life with his wife and new family. Daniel's brother Christian was released from prison in August 2017. In April 2018, after seven months and 24 days of freedom, Christian Cravinos, then 42, returned to prison, accused of assaulting his ex-girlfriend and attempting to bribe police to look the other way. Suzanne's half-open program has been revoked due to her not complying with disciplinary requirements of the prison. Fifteen years after the murder of her parents, Suzanne's defense asks that Suzanne serve the remainder of her sentence in prison. It is not clear why they requested this, probably due to public pressure and concerns about her safety once she is released. 
When a news crew asked random people on the streets of Sao Paulo if they knew who Suzanne von Richthofen was, every single one knew. She's the one who killed her parents. What she did is unforgivable. Suzanne has not even seen her brother Andreas since 2006. I know that my brother suffered a lot, but how we spent these years, I do not know. I imagine him outside. When he says his surname, anyone recognizes him and he will have to carry it forever. Despite successfully completing his studies and winning the lawsuit to attain his inheritance against his sister, Andreas became somewhat of a tragic figure. Footage of a drugged up Andreas being chased by police after he attempted to break into a house in the south zone of Sao Paulo shows that all is not well with Andreas. After this incident, which his uncle Miguel Abdallah claimed was a result of emotional distress, he was taken into a psychiatric hospital where he receives ongoing care. This is not a story with a happy ending. And one cannot help but wonder how different life would have been for this intelligent young man who, at one point, had the love and support of two parents who would help them have a prosperous adulthood. Today, Suzanne von Richthofen is stuck working in the prison uniform factory. She's become quite the inspiration for memes. Photoshop pictures of her face onto Orange is the New Black posters are floating around on social media. An employee at the cemetery where Marizia and Manfred are buried said that he has never seen anyone visit their graves. Scenes of grieving children and relatives are long forgotten. The scar of this crime will be on the minds of the people of Sao Paulo forever. If you'd like to read more about this case, have a look at the resources used for this episode in the show notes. If you like our podcast, please share with your friends. Also, visit and like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash evidence locker podcast to see more about today's case. This was the Evidence Locker. Thank you for listening.